To get the governance conversation started, let me introduce Lauren Thor Bjornsson, SDF's head of communications and an international governance veteran herself. She's gonna kick things off. Lauren, over to you. Thanks, Justin, and hello, Meridian. It is a pleasure to be here today, joining in a conversation about my passion, public policy and government. So I'm really honored to get to introduce today's first speaker. Dr. Jim Kim was the 12th president of the World Bank. And in that role, he made it the bank's top priority to end extreme poverty by 2030 and to boost shared prosperity, particularly for the bottom 40% of the population in developing countries. He led the bank in creating innovative financial instruments like facilities to address infrastructure needs, prevent pandemics, and help the millions of people forcibly displaced from their homes by climate shocks, conflict, and violence. His work advocating and fighting for those who need it most has spanned his entire career. He has led at other international organizations like the WHO, where he was the director of the HIV AIDS department. He co-founded Partners in Health, a nonprofit medical organization that provides health care to poor communities on four continents. And today he helps run Global Infrastructure Par Partners, a fund that invests in infrastructure projects around the world. He is a global policy leader that has tackled some of the most pressing and challenging problems we face in the world. So I couldn't think of anyone better to be here with us today and to share insights into how we can make a difference with technology and what we need to do to work with policymakers to implement our solutions. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Meridian. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren and Justin. It's really, uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, to be with you, and I'm very grateful for uh, the invitation. You know, I, I um, was very interested in uh, uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology before I left the World Bank uh, Group in 2019. And so this was an opportunity for me to really uh, understand where uh, things are moving. And it's just great to see how stellar, uh, you know, now I think more than 500 million operations from 4 million uh, accounts and been reading um, uh, about how so much has changed, even since when I left the bank uh, in, in, in 2019. Uh, groups like Deloitte have said that, that now in, uh, for, for executives, it's no longer a question of you know, will blockchain work, but how can we make blockchain work for us? And in their annual uh, survey of executives in 2019, 53% uh, of respondents said that blockchain technology has become a critical priority for their organizations. And that was a 10 point increase from just uh, 2018. Now, you know, I, I'm not an expert in digital finance. You guys uh, are the experts. But it immediately struck me when I was at the bank, um, you know, in the year of the founding of Stellar in 2015, especially, that blockchain te technology, although uh, it was, uh, it, it, it wasn't well understood, certainly not inside the World Bank Group, and certainly not in financial institutions, but that it had a huge potential for having a major impact in the world. And in, here are the areas where I immediately thought that there, 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 could, there could be an impact. And uh, the first one is universal access to financial services. And uh, what I was hoping to do today is to give you a bit of an insight into how global policy is made. How is it that, um, that major decisions happen about the issues that require uh, global governance far more than um, uh, some, some uh, other issues? First was universal access to financial services. You know, this was um, uh, when, when, uh, when I took over at the World Bank Group, um, they noticed, the people inside the bank noticed that I like goals. I like specific goals with specific end dates. And so we set one, which was the ending poverty and boosting shared prosperity by 2030. So a group of people inside the World Bank Group came to me and said, let's set a goal of universal access to financial services by 2020. And I just simply said, yeah, well, can we do it? Is it possible? And they said, oh, yes, we can do it. We can do it. And uh, my partner in, um, in this universal access to financial services uh, world was Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. Um, she's Argentinian by birth, uh, but was a finance professional. She really knew what she was talking about. And I spoke with her and I said, you know, we're going to announce this goal of universal access to financial services by 2020. She looked at me and she said, really, is that, you know, can you really get there? Boy, it sounds really difficult. Uh, and I said, well, my team tells me that, that we can get there. Let's announce it. And so she had this look of trepidation on her face, but we went out and at a, a World Bank meeting, uh, we announced this goal and there was wide coverage uh, in the press. And then what I did was I, I, I actually asked uh, my team after that meeting, all right, 
so what's the plan? And they told me, well, we don't have a plan. We just wanted to get you out front on this issue. And I said, okay, so we're going to have a, um, a, call it what you want, war room, peace room, action room. We're going to have a room in the bank that's focused on universal access to financial services, and we're going to figure out how to get there. A lot of progress has been, ma been made. We're still not there, uh, but it's such an important goal that I'm glad at this point uh, that we set the goal. Um, you know, the, the meaning of it is fairly straightforward, uh, uh, that all individuals and businesses in every part of the world uh, would have uh, access to useful and affordable financial products and services that meet their needs. And this is transactions, payments, savings, credit, and insurance. So that was the, that's the first area where I thought um, that, that, that blockchain could have a really big um, uh, impact. The second is remittances. Now, I understand that there's already a group that's using the Stellar platform uh, for improving access to remittances or lowering the cost of remittances in Africa. But this was something that I learned that was very shocking to me. Now, in OECD countries, uh, remittances as a percentage of uh, GDP are very, very low. So in OECD countries, it's something like 0.3%. But if you go to the so-called lower middle income countries, and so the, the World Bank has high income countries, middle income countries, and, uh, and low income countries, but there's also this category of lower middle income countries. Lower middle income countries as a whole is 5% of their GDP. So it's very, very significant. In the Philippines, uh, a large, rapidly growing middle income country, 9.3% of their GDP comes from remittances. In Senegal, and I, and, and I, and I bring up Senegal because it, it's a relatively successful uh, uh, African country on the west coast uh, 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 of the continent. They're at 10.7% of their economy is from remittances. Tajikistan, a former Soviet Republic, 28.6%. A country that I've worked in for years, Haiti, 38.5% uh, of their GDP comes from remittances. And, and uh, the, the, the highest remittance country, percentage remittance country in the world is Tonga. And this is true of many island nations, 40% of their GDP comes from remittances. So if we can lower the cost, and you know, when I left the bank, we were concerned because the costs were as high as nine to 10% of every uh, remittance uh, uh, would, would, would be taken by the company that was facilitating this process. This is a, a, a huge issue that I, I, I know that people on the Stellar platform are already dealing with. Another group, uh, and, and something that we worked hard on when we were at the World Bank Group, is to, uh, was entrepreneurs. And so we had many, many efforts for women entrepreneurs, for entrepreneurs in Africa. Uh, we felt that, that giving uh, the kind of training, giving the kind of access to markets that entrepreneurs need uh, to be successful would be a very important way uh, of, of trying to, to, to reduce poverty in the world. And I think, again, uh, the, the uh, access to financial services, the ability to access and move capital to work in many different um, uh, currencies uh, are, uh, can be just critical for entrepreneurs. But you know, <laughs> what, what, what I think I can tell you something about uh, from experience is how global governance works and how it might work for all of you uh, who are uh, trying to push forward uh, the, the, the impact of, of platforms like Stellar, but also blockchain as a whole uh, for, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, to make just business easier, uh, but also to tackle really important social justice issues. Well, I, I can tell, I don't, I don't probably need to tell anyone uh, on, uh, uh, on, uh, at this meeting that the challenges for global governance uh, have never been greater. Uh, we've seen the rise of inward-looking, nativist, xenophobic uh, political movements uh, that have taken over, in fact, some of the largest economies in the world. Multilateral institutions have been under attack. And I, I, I would say uh, multilateral institutions have been openly under attack uh, more than, uh, than uh, uh, at any time that I can remember. And I've been a close follower of the multilateral institutions for many, many years. Globalism, the notion of globalism, is also being openly attacked, uh, again, in some of the, the, the most powerful and uh, wealthy countries in the world. So I, I want to take you now um, into some very specific instances when global governance worked. And uh, again, I'm not an expert in digital finance. And so I hope that what I can do is give you uh, uh, specific scenarios, how we made things move forward, and then uh, uh, 
uh, all of you can come up with the right strategy for the issues that you're facing. So I think that the two greatest global challenges uh, that are directly related to nature uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the current uh, state of, uh, of the world in terms of specifically global governance, the two most difficult and most important challenges are climate change and of course pandemics. Uh, so let's start with climate change. You know, the Paris Agreement in 2015 was really one of the most important and, uh, uh, and frankly, in many ways, unexpected agreements uh, that we've had in the last few decades. The fundamental issue with passing the Paris Agreement, in my view, and, and there, there, look, there were lots of complicated issues. We were the World Bank Group, and, and I personally was very involved in the negotiations around uh, uh, the, 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 the so-called Conference of the Parties Agreement. But one of the biggest issues uh, was why should the developing countries uh, accept and, and uh, endorse this plan when they had so little to do with putting uh, the carbon in the air, but then may have to live with uh, intermittent energy? If, uh, if the African countries, for example, could only um, uh, use uh, solar and wind, then they would probably have only intermittent energy, and that would be very difficult uh, to attract industry if that were the case. So uh, what happened was that at the COP meeting in Copenhagen, and that was a meeting that was uh, very painful for many, many people because it was hoped that an agreement could be reached then, but it, it didn't, it failed. And so uh, one of the promises that were made, and in fact, one of the architects of that promise was uh, uh, at that time, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. The promise that was made was that $100 billion would move from rich countries to poor countries every year for climate related issues. Uh, for mitigation, which is the reduction of, uh, of, uh, of carbon uh, output, and also for adaptation. The poor countries were saying, look, we haven't put much of the carbon in the air, but we're the ones who are the biggest victims of climate change because we don't have climate uh, resilient roads. Our roads wash out every time it rains. We are, our, uh, our farming has been affected. We're going back and forth between drought and flooding, drought and flooding. We need to feel that this uh, agreement uh, is, is useful for us. And so what happened was uh, the, the uh, French who were hosting the meeting uh, became extremely, um, what's the right word? That they were extremely active in trying to get this agreement across the, the, the line. And so they came to me and said, we need the World Bank Group to make a major pledge of providing some big chunk of that $100 billion if we want this uh, agreement to go forward. And so uh, I, was, uh, I was visited by many uh, different members of uh, President Orlando's cabinet and uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, conversations came to a head right uh, during our annual meetings in 2015. Um, the, the, me the meetings that year were held in Lima, Peru. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Laurent Fabius, a very famous politician in France, actually came to this meeting and, and ministers of foreign affairs never come to World Bank IMF meetings. And they met with us and we struggled and struggled and finally, um, uh, we just made a decision, frankly, I just made the decision that we would pledge almost $30 billion a year by 2020 for climate change. And this is coming from an extremely low base. When I got to the World Bank Group, you know, uh, my predecessor, Bob uh, Zellick, had begun to really look at climate change, but we weren't investing much in it. And so to go from not very much to $30 billion a year, um, uh, frankly, the, the people inside the World Bank Group, my own staff, uh, were extremely worried, they were extremely unhappy that we made the decision. Good news is that we reached 30 billion, but once we pledged the 30 billion, all the other uh, uh, multilateral institutions had to come along. And so uh, the, the, the point here is that you've got to pick very carefully your targets when you're trying to make changes uh, on the global level around issues of global governance, regulations. You've got to pick the right targets You've got to get to the right meetings and you've got to put pressure in just the right way. This is how we got to the Paris Agreement. If we hadn't had that meeting where we reached almost, I think, 70 billion in that one meeting of pledges for, for, for climate change, the uh, developing countries would simply not have been uh, on board for the Paris uh, Agreement. Now, 
what have we learned since then? We've learned that uh, these global agreements are very fragile. Um, uh, you know, what happens when one uh, powerful country simply drops out? Uh, well, you know, uh, let me just um, uh, leave it by saying I'm very optimistic about what will happen um, uh, in, in 2021 in terms of getting back on board with these agreements. But I can tell you that just getting to that uh, agreement of, uh, of, of, of December of 2015 was so difficult. Now let's see where we are. Uh, but uh, again, I'm, I'm hopeful that in, in January, for reasons that probably everyone on, uh, on, on, online understands, uh, things will, will improve. One other example, and probably the example, the one example in the last hundred years that's required global governance, global cooperation, um, and more than at any other time has been COVID-19. Um, uh, I, I was originally trained as an infectious disease uh, physician and tackled many different uh, uh, pandemics and epidemics. And my work has been focused on, on trying to raise aspirations among global elites on what we do uh, uh, for poor countries around the major pandemics. So I worked on tuberculosis, I worked on HIV when I was in the bank, we worked on Ebola. And each time uh, the argument that we made was we need to do more. We need to do more for the poor in developing countries who are suffering from these diseases. And so we had some great um, uh, successes and uh, yet we knew that something like COVID-19, something like the coronavirus that we're dealing with now uh, uh, could strike uh, the planet and the entire global economy could be shut down. In fact, I was part of three different processes in which we made exactly that argument. The argument that this kind of crisis could happen has been made over and over and over again, and we have not heeded those warnings. The last time we made that argument was from the World Bank in 2019. There was a, a document called A World at Risk. And uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, um, uh, uh, Antonio Guterres and I, had commissioned the study precisely to prepare uh, so that something like what we witnessed in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa would not happen again. Well, the, the, the publication went out and of course, um, uh, COVID happened. So uh, I, 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 I would, um, the most important thing that I would say here is that, uh, you know, when, a, um, when a single country uh, decides that it's not going to play on the global stage, this has uh, very serious implications for uh, uh, the entire global governance system. But I don't want to leave you with just the, um, uh, the negative stories. And, I, and, and especially, I don't want to leave you uh, with the story of COVID. This has been the biggest disaster in terms of global cooperation and global governance uh, that we've seen in a very, very long time. You know, there's news of the vaccine. Um, I hope that, uh, that, that the vaccine has the impact that we want to have. But, you know, my friends at the World Health Organization, you know, I was head of HIV, the HIV department right after the SARS uh, epidemic was over. So some of my very good friends in the, in the global health world are actually running the WHO response right now. They've done such a wonderful job and they've predicted just about everything that's happened. And the, the, the most recent thing that they've said is that, you know, uh, getting a vaccine is like building your base camp uh, on Mount Kilimanjaro, right? Now you've got to start the walk up and the walk up is going to be much more difficult than, the, than, than, than just simply the discovery of the vaccine. And I think that's true. And it will also require much better global governance. You know, uh, let me leave you with, uh, with, with one very uh, uh, positive story about how global governance has worked and a personal story. So, you know, we have these institutions of global governance, like the G20, uh, the World Bank, the United Nations, for very specific purposes, that there have to be places where we can sit down and make decisions and act together in a way that will benefit the entire world. So there was one meeting uh, of the G20, and I participated in all the G20 leaders meetings and the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meetings uh, for the seven years that I was at the World Bank Group. And at one meeting, a, a particular very important country in the G20 decided that it was going to attack its uh, economic um, concerns by lowering interest rates at the central bank and, in fact, going to, zero, the, to negative interest rates. And uh, what happened was that the countries that competed with that particular country said, this is a currency war, you're devaluating, you're devaluing your, your currency just so that your exports are cheaper, 
this is terrible. And so we all got together on, on a very cold uh, 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 week in the winter in a very cold place. And uh, we decided together that walking out of that room, nobody would mention the word currency war. Nobody would mention uh, the, the notion of beggar thy neighbor policies. We would speak differently about um, uh, the rumors and accusations that were happening before we walked in that room. And as we walked out, we were gonna try to uh, calm the global economy by saying uh, things that we all agreed on. We did it and things in fact did calm down. So this is why the G20 was founded. It was founded in the, in the wake of the global financial crisis and it had the exact impact that we wanted it to have at that moment. And so it's possible, it's possible to use these institutions for uh, outcomes that you never uh, would have expected without those institutions. If we got rid of the multilateral institutions, the World Bank, the UN, and others, we would simply have to reinvent them because they're so important. Now, I wanna leave you with a, with, with a very personal story. So uh, one of my last trips uh, to Africa was to Tanzania. And I visited a classroom and as I like to do, I asked them some very straightforward questions. And the first one was, what do you wanna be when you grow up? One boy raised his hand and said, I wanna be president of the World Bank. And so his teachers laughed, my own staff uh, laughed, uh, but then I stopped them because I said, you know, um, I was born in Korea in 1959. Uh, and in 1963, which was the first year that uh, Korea got uh, a, a World Bank loan, this is what the World Bank wrote about the Republic of Korea far removed from the main trade routes of the world with a dense and rapidly growing population, but only meager natural resources, Korea would in any case find it difficult without foreign aid to provide its people with more than the bare necessities of life. And it must be recognized that even with the best of intentions and soundest of policies, the country's achievement of a self-supporting economy would be a very distant goal and progress toward it is slow. It wasn't until 1963 that the World Bank thought that Korea could even pay back the lowest interest loans. So what I said to that boy and to my own staff is that in 1963, I was a four-year-old in Korea uh, in preschool. And I said that if George David Woods, the president of the World Bank in 1963, had visited my preschool class on a trip to Korea, I don't think he possibly could have imagined that one of his successors was sitting in that room. You know, the, the, one of the most exciting things that I saw in my 10 years of World Bank Group is explosion of aspirations. People can see on their smartphones and just about everyone is gonna have access to a smartphone. Most people will have their own smartphones. They can see how everyone else lives. Aspirations are exploding. And I think there is no question that access to financial services, access to platforms like Stellar are gonna be a critical part of opening up the world so that everyone can become whatever their imagination, uh, wherever their imagination leads them. If that, that, you know, the becoming president of the World Bank is hard if you're not an American, but I wanted those children to know that the world is changing and that they need to change it themselves. Finally, uh, how do you do this? So I would just leave you uh, with this story that I heard on one of my first days in Washington, D.C. They said uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was meeting with the head of a labor union. The labor union told him all these things that, that uh, he wanted uh, uh, President Roosevelt to do. And President Roosevelt said, you know, those are all good ideas. So now go out there and make me do it. And so this is what I would say. These multilateral institutions, uh, political leaders, uh, will not do these, not do the things that you need them to do around governance uh, uh, in, 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 in your world, in the blockchain world, unless you go out and make them do it. And I've had so many people come to me and make me do things that I never would have thought I would have done if they hadn't come to me. So go out and do it. And I think together we can move toward this goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. That was um, a fascinating talk. A lot to unpack there. We have a few minutes left for questions if you're up to take a few from the audience. 
Um, we, we have a little bit of time here. So I think building off, you know, kind of your closing note there, what you were just saying, you know, going out there, talking to people. Obviously, there's a lot of um, different perspectives when we're talking to global policymakers, a lot of different interests. Uh, so I, I'm curious, you know, in your experience, maybe from COP21 or G20, when you're talking to all these people with different perspectives, how could maybe building off of that experience, how could we, um, you know, help some of these global policy makers who maybe are holding out a little bit on the promise of blockchain to help them see this as a viable option uh, to help transform the global financial system? Yeah, you know, I think one of the great strengths of blockchain technology is, uh, um, is partly what, what I had said earlier. I think there's so much possibility uh, for helping these major institutions achieve their goals. We found out that um, for the 17 global goals that the UN established, I think it was 2014, 2015, some, somewhere around there, the global goals, of the 17 major global goals, seven of them require greater access to financial services. So I, I, you know, I think you guys have to make clear that you're on the right side of history in terms of social justice, in terms of ending poverty, and make it clear that your technology will facilitate their goals. I think that's what everyone is beginning to understand, uh, that the, the corporate leaders are beginning to understand that, hey, it's not about you know fighting over technology. It's about using this technology to help us move toward our own goals. And you know, in um, in preparing for this uh, discussion, I was just uh, reading very broadly, and I I think it's much more true than when I left that uh, blockchain technology can directly impact um, goals like ending poverty in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think the remittance use case is definitely a huge one, and we're really focused on that on the Stellar Network. I actually have a, a question here from the audience um, from Marius. He's he's curious. He says, you know, many people are still extremely afraid of switching from actual physical money to digital currencies. Uh, do you think that could change with changing demographics, or um, you know, what are your perspectives on that? Yeah, I've seen it move extremely quickly. So um, Kenya has uh, used digital currency maybe more than any other. A, a country in the world, let alone uh, Africa. And so when I went to visit Kenya, I was with a, a, um, uh, a minister. Uh, I think he was minister of communications at the time. And he, uh, he was from the Maasai tribe. And he told me that his mother uh, doesn't speak English, can't read, and is innumerable, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't understand counting. He said, but he sends her money all the time through their uh, digital payment system. And he says, it, it's very simple. My mother goes uh, to the local store and uh, she, she goes to the person who speaks Maasai and says, uh, my son told me that if I push this button four times that you can access my account, right? And so she pushes the button four times and he sends her money. So even in places where people are illiterate and innumerate, uh, the, um, uh, the, the digital payment systems have had a huge positive impact. And so I think the adoption is gonna be far more uh, rapid than, than anyone can imagine. I mean, you know, you can't use credit cards now in China, in Korea, everything is done uh, through these payment systems. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's definitely powerful when you hear use cases like that. A, a question for you kind of about maybe your experience at the World Bank or, you know, other inter intergovernmental organizations. Do you think there are use cases for blockchain actually in your organizations to disperse, you know, loans or, or other financial instruments that you build uh, at these organizations? Absolutely. You know, I, I, um, again, in preparing for, for the talk, I talked to some of my former colleagues and they said that the number of people of concept uh, cases now is just exploding. Education, healthcare, even now I think what they're working on is, is probably one of the greatest challenges is transferring money uh, and uh, between multilateral institutions. And so they're very close to having solved that problem. And boy, if they, when they solve the problem of money moving back and forth between multilateral institution, you'll know that we're really moving forward quickly. So there's, in other words, there are many, many use cases. And uh, I think, uh, um, you know, just, just, give, let's, just to give you one example, just having uh, the ability um, to transfer money in different currencies as easily as, uh, as you guys have done at Stellar is, uh, is a huge boon for anyone trying to do business uh, across borders. And increasingly more and more people are. You know, one of the most important uh, uh, economic models is the one that's been shown to us. The e-commerce models coming out of China, Alibaba, Tencent again. And uh, um, one of the big issues is inter convertibility of currency. And, uh, um, you know, clearly you guys have solved that uh, uh, problem in a pretty dramatic way. Absolutely. 
Thank you. I, you know, we are unfortunately at time. I'm sure we could have asked you so many more questions, um, but we really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. It was so insightful. Uh, thank you so much. And I will turn it back over to uh, Justin to take us forward for the rest of the day.